Hello and welcome to today's KDP Universities at Home with Talia Hibbert. I'm Trisha and for the past five years I've moved around Amazon's books teams learning the business so I can share it with authors. But we're here to talk to Talia. One of USA Today's top 100 black novelists and fiction writers that you should read, Talia Hibbert is dedicated to giving positive representation to people of marginalized, um, identified uh, through her love stories. Uh, Hibbert's steamy romances have landed her on USA Today's and Wall Street Journal's bestseller lists. And her Danny Brown is up for top romance novel in the Goodreads Choice Awards. Talia lives in the English Midlands in a bedroom full of books. And supposedly there is a world beyond that room, but she has yet to drum up enough interest to investigate. She loves makeup, junk food, and unnecessary sarcasm. Welcome, Talia. Hi. Hi, there you are. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm great, thanks. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Good. And congratulations. So the Goodweeds Choice Awards, are you super excited? Oh, thank you. I am super excited. Like, I can't believe it. <laughs> Very <laughs> excited about that one. <laughs> Is this the first year that you've made it for the Goodweeds Choice Awards? Yeah, oh, I never wonderful. even dreamed it was going to you know, I remember last year I was looking at the list and I was like, gosh, it must be so cool to be on here. And then I looked this year and I was like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute, that's me. <laughs> what, nice. So um, so let's talk a little bit, get some little background uh, before we start getting into some of the nitty gritty. But I always like to ask, uh, when did you decide that being an author was your calling? I honestly have wanted to be an author my entire life. That was like my unrealistic pipe dream that I carried through childhood. <laughs> um, but it wasn't until I was in my last year of university that a lot of things changed in my life very quickly. And I was kind of pushed into this situation where I was like, OK, it's time to try something that maybe I didn't have the guts to try before. And then to my astonishment, it worked. <laughs> Awesome. So did you always self-publish or did you try to traditionally publish? I went right into self-publishing. Um, first of all, because I kind of needed money like right then. <laughs> um, and second of all, because it I honestly never thought that I would be able to get a traditional deal. Um, and I have managed to get one now, but I believe that was very much influenced by what I was able to build through self-publishing. I think if I'd just come as I was, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have had as much of a chance. So why did you feel that you would never get a, a traditional publishing deal? A couple of reasons. There's definitely, you know, just I think it's normal to always think that could never happen for me. Um, but then on top of that, you hear so many horror stories, especially for marginalized people who want to write about marginalized people, you know, mm -hmm. and you see it as a reader as well. You can tell when a publisher has like one black story per season and they're obviously not interested in more than that or, you know, you see that some books have this marginalization or that marginalization, but you can tell it's rare to have multiply marginalized identities. So like, for example, I'm disabled and I'm queer and I'm black all at the same time. And I wasn't seeing a lot of that around at the time. So it made me feel much less confident. Gotcha. So do you, let's talk about the genres that you write in. So what is the genre that you primarily write in? I write romance because uh, I love romance. It's my fave. Um, but obviously, romance has like a huge number of subgenres, and I love those as well. But um, right now, it's mainly contemporary and some paranormal. Okay, all right. So with the subgenres, you you mentioned um, all, a lot of marginalized care um, categories. What do you write in those categories? Oh yeah, definitely. So my characters kind of come from across the spectrum of humanity, because not only is that what I experience myself, it's what I experience around me. You know, obviously my family members and the people that I'm friends with, we're all different. And so that's what I want to write and what I naturally write. Okay. 
So when you first published, um, you published a couple novels pretty quickly, right? Yeah, quite quickly. <laughs> How did those go? Oh, very badly. Um, <laughs> I wrote, you know, I'd never finished a book before that point when I decided that I was going to self-publish. So obviously I was like, OK, first things first, let's see if I can actually complete something. Um, so I wrote a book, I uploaded it. Surprise, surprise, no one bought it. <laughs> um, everything that I had done, I was really just kind of trying my best, but not very informed or experienced. Um, mm -hmm. But I kind of applied those lessons, wrote another book, tried to do better with that one. No one bought that one either. I think in my first two months with my first two books, I made like £1.43. And I am so confident that that was my mum buying those. I know it was her. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> so what did you change? Can you talk? We have a lot of authors that are kind of brand new and they're they're in that position where they've published a couple books. They're not really taking off. Mom's the one buying them. So can you share some of the this, you know, what did you learn? And then how did you overcome that? Yeah, absolutely. I am um, another self-published author, Sky Warren, who was kind enough to send out these marketing advice emails. She always talks about how to get like an advert correctly. You have to do this version and fail and do the next version and fail. And that's true, I think, for everything in self-publishing, but especially for books. So, you know, my first book that I wrote, I was getting a feel for the kind of story that was in my heart. And when I was publishing it, I was kind of learning where those stories fit in the market. Um, and I didn't get it right the first time, obviously. But the next time I thought, OK, I did my own cover the first time. I'm going to go professional this time. Um, the book last time was shorter, so I'm going to go a bit longer, see if I can interest people in something that's a bit more worth their money. Um, and also I studied, you know, my book was failing. I studied what was succeeding. And I thought, OK, how can I be more like this? Um, mm -hmm. So my second book was longer. It was much more kind of tightly plotted with like a hook that I could put in the blurb so people knew what it was about and all those mm -hmm. important things. <laughs> right. um, and that one also didn't do great, but I felt like I was going in the right direction. So mm -hmm. that's kind of when I moved to my third book, which was very much I knew what was out there. I knew where I wanted to be. You know, here's a list of books and I want to be that one. I want to look like that and I want to sell like that. And so mm -hmm. as I was writing, I kept that in mind. You know, readers know what they want. How can I clearly indicate from the title, from the blurb, from the cover that, hey, this is that thing you want and it's going to be exactly how you want it. You can trust me. That was the thing I had to learn. <laughs> right, right. How to communicate that effectively. That's important. Mm. And then you so know, how did follow that... through with the book. <laughs> so how did that third book work? Um, that one was a big change. That third book, I made a month's wage in that month, release month, which was a big jump from my £1.43. <laughs> right. And I was like, OK, this is working. I was shocked, but I was like, clearly it's working. Let's keep going. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm very glad I did. Good. Well, we are too, definitely. <laughs> um, so let's talk about some of those marketing things that you learned um, and how you apply them now that you're you're much larger, you're much more well known. Um, but what are what were some of those key marketing tools that you you really picked up on and that you implemented? There are a couple of things, or I categorize them that way in my mind. And the first thing is, um, it's kind of like how you present the book as a whole. So like I mentioned, conveying exactly what that book is about and what it's trying to do, and doing it in a way that readers can look at it and instantly know, oh, that's the thing that I wanted. Um, so tying in the blurb, the title, the cover, and making sure that the story is kind of threaded through all those hooks so it all comes together. That was the key thing for me. Um, mm -hmm. And with that, there comes an awareness of things like, if I'm writing in this subgenre, what tropes does that usually have? How long is it usually? What point of view? What, you know, tense or whatever? Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I focused on was obviously, once you've got your perfectly packaged book, how do you show it to people? 
And I actually mm -hmm. had a lot of luck with kind of discoverability just through the Amazon search engine because you can fiddle with your metadata and things like that, figure out keywords. But I also had to build an audience through things like social media and email marketing. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I learned was really important was in the back of the book, always putting, hey, come and talk to me here, come and sign up to this so you can know about the next book. And those two things together really changed things for me. So you talked a little bit about tropes, and I think this always comes up, is how much do you put of yourself in the book? And then how much do you change to accommodate your reader? Um, well, lucky for me, I love tropes. And as a reader, I'm a very bog standard, ordinary reader. I like what's popular. <laughs> so I like to write what's popular. <laughs> um, so. I always, always want to appeal to readers because, you know, one reason why I'm writing stories is that I love the feeling a certain story can give me and I want to give that to other people. So mm -hmm. writing something that readers are going to love and that hits all those emotional beats that they crave is really important to me. But also those have to be the beats that I love, too. Um, mm -hmm which is why, for example, I wouldn't write like a thriller because I find thrillers very upsetting, so I don't want to write that. <laughs> yeah, I think that would probably be traumatic to write a thriller <laughs> if that, that's upsetting for you. Um, with identifying what's resonating with your uh, audience, how do you do that? How do you make sure that the, the tropes that you're using, the language that you're using is really resonating with that audience? Well, the hardest part there was kind of figuring out who I was as a writer, because you do obviously really want to find an audience and resonate with them. And sometimes that pulls you in the direction of certain trends that actually don't work for you. So you find yourself writing something that your heart's not really in and you're not doing it right because you don't know if you're hitting the notes because you don't feel anything when they are hit. So how do you know you don't? Um, so the key thing for me definitely was figuring out what when I was writing, what stories really made me sing? What got me excited to write it? What made me kind of sit back and think, oh, my God, that scene was incredible. And once mm -hmm. I figured that out, then I could kind of pare that down to the bare bones and make sure that I hit it hard. So it's really mm -hmm. about knowing yourself and knowing the genre really well, I think, is like the, mm -hmm. the key to giving readers what they want. So we talk frequently with other authors about building a team. I'm assuming when you first started, it was you. And I'm now that I know that you, <laughs> you're, you're partly traditionally published, that you, you now have a bit of a team. So let's talk about that journey. Kind of how did you handle everything with the first couple and figure out, ooh, like you said, oh, I designed these myself, the covers, they didn't work so well, so I needed to add a cover designer. Can we talk about that a bit? I mean, the cover thing was pretty easy because my artistic skills are non-existent. <laughs> that first cover was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then obviously you have to strike the balance of, yes, I need help, but do I have the money for help? Um, mm -hmm. And the great thing with KDP is that by the time I was at that point, I had already been paid for books that actually made some decent money. So I was like, okay, now I can reinvest it. Um, so my first thing was a cover designer. Then I had to get an editor because for a long time, no one was editing my books. I was like, this will have to do. I've read it 70 times. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> so getting an editor was like definitely the biggest change to my process that made the most difference. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what else? I'm a bit of a control freak. So it has taken me a long time, aside from necessities, to get kind of help and more of a team. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it definitely is important. You know, when you catch yourself doing those jobs that have to be done and you want to stab yourself in the eye, that's when you know yes. that you need to get someone else to do that <laughs> if you can. <laughs> right, right. So what are some of the other things that you've, so cover design, you're outsourcing, um, editing, you're outsourcing. What else are you, have, what else are you asking for help with? Um, I got an accountant because I can't do maths. 
um, and it seemed important to keep track of everything but I knew that I wasn't because I didn't want to and that was bad right. um, <laughs> I have got some help with managing my emails and my social media um, mm -hmm. I mean the help is my boyfriend but it's all very official um, because I was so worried you know when you hire someone that you don't really know and they're talking directly to readers it's like I don't want you mm -hmm. to say something terrible so mm -hmm. I just got him to do it because I know he's a normal person <laughs> right. um, and I've gotten some help with PR recently as well which has been great because I'm a bit awkward and I don't know how these things work so when people come to me with opportunities I'll be like okay and not know what to do <laughs> whereas now I have someone who actually knows how to talk like a normal human being it's all going much more smooth. <laughs> Well, I think you're doing just fine on this interview, so not awkward at all. <laughs> Thanks. But that's, I think that's a really good call out is being able to identify, one, the things that you don't like doing, but also the things that you may have a weakness with and then building your team from that. Mm. Do you have, uh, the question always comes up, do you have beta readers? Yes. Um, actually, when I started, like I mentioned, I couldn't afford an editor, but because I was at uni and I was doing an English degree, I was lucky to mm -hmm. be surrounded by friends who like to read. So I was like, can you check? This isn't terrible for me. And at that point, I didn't really know what beta readers were, but they have mm -hmm. maintained their status as my first readers up till now. Um, so, yeah, I guess I actually always had beta readers built in. And I'm glad because if I hadn't, I know that some of my books would have been terrible. <laughs> well, it was good that you had those friends to be able to do some of the editing for you before you could hire an editor. Exactly, I was very lucky. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about your marketing today. So we know that in the beginning, there wasn't much marketing. Since then, you've built a newsletter, you've built your social media platform, so what does a marketing, when you release a book right now, what does that look like? Well, I've tried a lot of different things. For example, um, people talk about like various advertisement systems. Um, but like I mentioned, I really hate maths and I hate anything technical. And so doing those stressed me out and I was doing it wrong. And I was like, screw it, I'm not gonna do it anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> I stopped doing that. <laughs> So now I kind of have three pillars for a release. And the first is definitely my newsletter. That is like mm -hmm. gold to me. That is the most important thing because, you know, the way that I um, gather people for my newsletter, I don't do things like, oh, you know, do this 10 author box set and you are automatically added to all of our newsletters. I mm -hmm. try to get only organic sign up. So you've read my book and you liked it so much that when you reach the end, and you saw me post the link to the newsletter, you were like, yeah, I'm gonna do that. Those are the readers that I want to collect because mm -hmm. they actually really want to be involved in my work and to know when the next book is coming. They have volunteered their information. They've invited me. They're like, please tell me about the next book. So I'm like, okay, yes, I will. <laughs> and they're definitely the most important because they're the only readers who you can guarantee they're actually interested in you. So, right. I try to give them like exclusives and, and maybe insights into what's coming next or what my process is like. And that kind of keeps them engaged. And that way when I do have a release, I can just send it out to my list and I already probably achieve like what I wanted to achieve with the release just based on them. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously I always want to grow as well. So that's kind of what I use social media for because that's a good way to spread the word. Um, and like with everything else, I've had to experiment on which is the most effective for me, on which type of post is the most effective for each platform. Um, and it's the kind of thing that you have to put a lot of time into. And in the, in the beginning, you get very little reward. But all the data mm -hmm. that you collect, you can eventually choose which platform is going to be your biggest tool. So for me, I have figured out that Twitter is where I kind of make the most of my sales through spurring word of mouth marketing you know if i have like an interesting piece of information about my book or an interesting marketing angle that's a bit weird and a bit niche i know i can put it on twitter and people are going to start talking about it and that conversation is going to spread it into different kind of reaches of the reader sphere um, right, right. <laughs> 
And then I'm trying to think, what do I do aside from those two? Surely I must do more marketing than that. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I always try to get involved with like bloggers and book review sites and kind of it doesn't even have to be book related, you know, like magazines that I know are reaching my target readers. If I have something mm -hmm. interesting or relevant to write for them, I find it really helpful to write something that's kind of funny and shows my voice and shows my values. And then at the end, when I've blown you away with my sparkling wit, you get a little note that says, this woman has a book, you can buy it here. I found that very funny. There you go. <laughs> So where do you find the bloggers and the influencers or the reviewers that you interact with? Well, I'm lucky that because I've been so into romance personally, I kind of have built that community on my social media and that helps a lot mm -hmm. with discovering those people. But also you just have to do a bit of good old fashioned research because, you know, there are so many readers in the world and genre, mm -hmm. genre books in general are so huge that in romance, for example, multiple times a year I discover an author I've never heard of who has a massive audience who is writing books that I love and I'm like where were you what were we in the same how have I been this whole time <laughs> <laughs> that's how huge it is so you have to mm -hmm. keep on top of it and keep going because no matter how huge you are there will still be a huge section of readers who just haven't heard of you mm -hmm. yeah because there's just so much out there right now yeah um, now, in 2018, you published A Girl Like Her through KDP, and um, you've mentioned that this is responsible for elevating your career. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and why you say that this is what elevated my career? Yeah, so like I said, the third book that I published, um, it was like a big jump and I started getting readers and I was like, oh, this is exciting. So I kept publishing a book a month because I wanted to keep that momentum going. And I felt kind of stable at the level that I was at. And then I thought, OK, I've been working really hard. I'm just going to write something for fun, like just a story that I have in my head that's super indulgent and tropey and silly. And so I wrote it. And when it was done, I was like, well, I wrote it. I might as well sell it. There's no use just leaving it on the on the computer. So I did. And that was I mean, it was my first Amazon.co.uk bestseller. Um, it was the first time I could have even sniffed the bestseller list anywhere. I was astonished. Um, and the word of mouth that spread around that book, I had like sites that I'd never heard of emailing me being like we loved your book can we talk to you about blah 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 and I was like what is happening and in the end I realized that because that was more than any book I'd ever written absolutely the book of my heart and of my voice I had just really knocked it out of the park with that one mm -hmm. and I guess people really liked it and you know after that I got an agent by accident I got this I got that I met loads of new people and I was like okay I'm gonna keep doing this this is good so what was special besides the fact that this was the book of your heart what else was special about this what was different from what you were doing previously well I'd always felt a bit self-conscious about the fact that the way I write naturally is not super high concept and super plot heavy you know, there are a lot of authors I love to read who write very dramatic, complex books like uh, Kennedy Ryan, um, mm -hmm. Dylan Allen. I read their books and I'm like, oh, I wish I could write like this, but I can't. <laughs> um, so by writing something with no expectations that was just purely me, I ended up writing this small town, neighbors to lovers, what I like to call very cozy romance that mm -hmm. predominantly took place in the home. And it was all about like, friendship and kindness and no one was especially terrible and I also really focused because I let myself not care about plot so much I focused as much as I wanted to on complexities of character and really mining mm -hmm. situations emotionally and I kind of accidentally discovered that that's my real strength um, and I think that that kind of relatability and vulnerability of the characters appealed to a lot of the readers who became now my audience. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that was the key difference. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about your covers. Within romance, um, I think there's there's all this conversation 
um, about covers and who should be on covers and should they be, you know, um, you know, what should they look like? Should, should the people, you know, what do they look like? Tell us a little bit about your thoughts about the cover design for your books. Well, I love kind of classic romance covers, or I used to call them American covers, because over here, we've always had illustrated covers for romance, and they've always been very polite. And then you see the American books, and there's like heaving bosoms and glistening chests. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, that's amazing. Um, so when I started, I really wanted to do that. But I kind of ran into a wall because a lot of my characters weren't white and thin and able-bodied and when you're kind of looking at stock photography from the cheapest to even now the most expensive that diversity wasn't very easy to find um, mm -hmm. so that was tricky for me I'm very lucky now that as I've made more money I've been able to access photos that are like yes that's what I saw that's right or even that's vaguely representative of the characters in this book <laughs> that is right. like I think that being able to have whatever cover image you want is a privilege that some authors don't even realize that they have. But for those of us mm -hmm. who can't do that, we're so jealous of everyone else. We're so jealous, you guys. <laughs> but, you know, the recent trend for illustrated covers has obviously really helped because now as long as you mm -hmm. can pay your illustrator, you can have whatever kind of cover you want. And I've really enjoyed that. Um, mm -hmm. So I like... I like um, both because I know there's a bit of a divide between photograph covers and illustrated. I like both, but photograph covers have their issues from the publisher end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I love, I think it's the Brown Sisters. Is that correct? They, yeah. I love those covers. I absolutely <laughs> adore them. Um, I identify you. with the, the fact that the women on the cover are, you know, voluptuous. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, let's see, let's go ahead and take, I see that we've got lots of questions coming in from um, the attendees. So let's oh, see yeah. if we can ask some of these questions. So um, let's see. Oh. Oh. Sorry, sometimes they're a little hard to sort initially. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned the fact that you're self-published, you're, you're being successful as a self-publisher, you're a bit of a control freak. So why would you transition into traditional publishing? Well, the reason why I kind of thought about it or considered it in the first place was that I'm also a bit of a completionist and I felt like I've never tried this, I should try it so that I know, you know how it works. Um, mm -hmm. And also because like I mentioned, I'd got an agent and she's really helpful with kind of selling the subsidiary rights of my self-published books. So, for example, I don't know how to sell the rights to a German publisher. I'm not going to do that. So she does that for me. Um, but I kind of felt bad because I was like, well, you also want to submit traditional books to me and I haven't given you any. So <laughs> I guess I was being very polite, which is incredibly weird and not a business model that anyone should adopt. Um, I gave it a go. And... I was just really pleasantly surprised by, you know, the, the editors that I talked to, especially the editor that I ended up working with, um, like how supportive and invested in my kind of story they were. Um, mm -hmm. So that really encouraged me to keep going and give it a try. And I found the experience to be a lot of fun because you do have that massive team around you that at that mm -hmm. point I had no experience of. You know, working with that team while being traditionally published is really what taught me what kind of team I needed to build for my self-publishing business. Mm -hmm. So it was just really useful experience all round. Um, and it was a chance to do something a bit different, which was fun. So are you still working with traditional publishers or was it kind of a one off situation? Um, I'm not really doing anything at the minute, but I feel like I will in the future. But at the same time, mm -hmm. I definitely want to continue self-publishing and I don't want, you know, traditional publishing can be a bit of a runaway train if you don't get a hold of it. So I don't want to kind of get too immersed in that and forget about the other side of my career. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we have a question about who your book designer is. Do you use one specific book designer or do you use multiple book designers? Um, my main book designer for my self-published books, I've had a few, um, but right now I work most with Natasha Snow, who I love, I'm super happy with her. <laughs> um, but then I recently actually wanted an illustrated cover for one of my older books to kind of match the direction of Brown Sisters. Um, mm -hmm. So I worked with Erin O'Neill, who is an amazing illustrator on that, and the cover hasn't been revealed yet, but it is done, and I can't wait for it to be revealed because it's amazing. I love it. <laughs> do you do you reveal your covers before you publish to your newsletter or to your social media? I do, not super far in advance, but kind of the day before, um, mm -hmm. because things take a little while to upload. I will kind of, the day before D-Day, uh, I have no idea why I called it D-Day, I'm sure that stands for something, but I've forgotten what. Um, I will upload it all, and I know that it'll be on by the next day, and so when I'm done, I write an email revealing the cover, so it's kind of like a day in advance, and it's like, you're the first people to see this, and right. it's gorgeous, and it's coming out tomorrow, yay! <laughs> so when is your new, next book release? Uh, my next book is a Christmas romance that's coming out in November. Um, that's mm -hmm. like a little novella that I did very quickly. Um, and then after that in March, it's the third Brown Sisters book, which is called Act Your Age, Eve Brown. And I'm really excited about that one. That was, that was a lot of fun to write. Good. Um, so the first two books that you wrote, um, once you started kind of understanding the process a little bit better, did you go back and rewrite them or did you recover them? Yeah, it was a bit, it was all very kind of, I did a bit and bob situation. So I went back and changed the cover of the first book to be in line with my new brand. But then a few books later, my brand changed. And I felt like not only were the covers of the books not suited, but maybe the content wasn't so suited either because I was just kind of finding my voice and who I was as an author. So I took those off sale and I made them free for newsletter signups, um, which worked for a while. But then I got to the point where I kind of started thinking, okay, my newsletter is my most valuable tool. It's great for reader retention. Do I want, the freebie they received to be something that isn't my best work and isn't super representative of the rest. Um, mm -hmm. So in the end, I just kind of took them out of circulation completely. Um, I do still get emails, people being like, where is this book? Where is that book? I want to read all your books. And I'm like, you'll be fine without those ones. <laughs> you really don't need those. They're all right. <laughs> So uh, Sherry wants to know, do you do ads, either Facebook or Amazon ads? Um, I have in the past, but I wasn't very good at them. I did once. This is like when fishermen say that they got like an enormous fish. I did an amazing Amazon ad that like pushed my book super far up the list and it made me a ton of money. And I was like, this is amazing. But like I mentioned, I'm really bad at maths um, and graphs and anything like that. So I've never been able to recreate it. <laughs> and um, I get loads of books that are like, here's advice on how to do it. And I start reading them and then I'm like, I hate numbers. <laughs> and I stop. Um, so now I don't do ads, but if you are able to do them, I feel like you should, because I have friends who are like, why aren't you doing ads? They've done this, this and this for me. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. my brain is not amenable to that sort of thing, so no. <laughs> So I think that that's a really good call out is if that's something that just isn't in your wheelhouse and doesn't work for you, find the, what does. I don't mm. think it, there's only one right solution for everyone and being able to figure out the solution that's right for you is, is what works. I agree. Yeah, that's what I've found. Rather than pouring blood, sweat and tears into something that I'm never going to make it work, I can pour that <laughs> energy into something better. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we have a question. Do you publish in both paperback or ebook? And does one perform better for you? Um, I used to be ebook only, and then 
you know, because paperback just seemed like one more complicated thing. You have to pay a bit more for a paperback cover. You have to upload on yet another platform. Um, but what made me start publishing paperbacks more was actually signing the traditional deal and realizing in a year's time when this book comes out, I'm going to snatch up a new audience of readers who prefer to read in paperback. And once I figured that out, I was like, OK, so the backlist needs to be in paperback. Um, depending on which books I was 100 percent satisfied with, I some didn't put in paperback right away because I was like, I want to double check this or I want to change the cover on that. But my main books, like, for example, my Ravenswood series, which is my best selling series, um, mm -hmm. I got those out right away. And in 2021, kind of early 2021, my goal is to have every single book available in paperback because in the last couple of months, paperback sales for me on Amazon have gone up to like, what, 15% of my sales? Um, oh, wow. Which has been like a slow and steady build over the last year. But now that I'm mm -hmm. seeing the benefit, I'm like, more paperbacks, yay. <laughs> What about ebooks? Have you started moving into ebooks at all? Yeah, so I've always focused on ebooks. I really love them um, because that's actually how I read myself. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was thinking about self publishing, I was really just thinking, like, I'm going to upload these ebooks and people like me are going to read them. Yay! Um, especially because I write romance. And when I started, I was quite young and I was still remembering, like, using ebooks because I didn't want my mum to see a cover and be like, what are you reading? <laughs> so, I think we all have a little bit of that. <laughs> so I think I've always been quite like ebook focused. I think they're great because, you know, all the links that you can have in the back are great for read through and getting information from your readers and join my group or sign up to my list. So I like them. What about audiobooks? Um, so my agent sorts out my audiobook deals um, because I hate organizing things. <laughs> I know that some people do their own audiobooks, and apparently that's doing really well. But yeah, uh -huh. I hate organizing things. Um, but I love actually having the audiobooks because for one thing, obviously it's an issue of accessibility. Like some people. Uh -huh can't read or can't look at things for a long time or can't see. My boyfriend only reads audiobooks because he's dyslexic and I don't <laughs> want someone to hear about my book and think, oh, that sounds great, and then be like, oh, I can't read it because there's no audiobook. So not all of my books are in audiobook because I found that the shorter ones, publishers are like, yeah, we don't want that. Um, <laughs> so I'm working on it. Maybe those are the ones that I will kind of publish the audiobooks myself. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's something to think about. That's a good call out. I think that um, a lot of authors look at audiobooks as a really kind of a nice to have, but pointing out that there's an accessibility part of it is, is I think, really poignant. Um, all right. I think we answered some of these, sorry. Oh, um, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to your newsletter, uh, how frequently do you publish the newsletter? Um, I try to send them out twice a month. That's my minimum thing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of quite vague about it. So maybe on the 15th and then on the 30th or it depends um, kind of around my releases, for example. Um, but yes, mm -hmm. twice a month because, well, at first I started doing that because I was publishing a book a month. So I had to tell people about them. <laughs> um, but then I found that the more emails I sent, you know, up to a certain point, the more engaged people were and the more likely they were to actually open them. So I settled on twice a month as my sweet spot. And I found it really valuable because, you know, if you don't have a release to talk about, you you can just use that as like a relationship builder. Um, so talking about books that you've read that you think your readers will also enjoy um, or what you're writing right now and what's really inspiring you about it. And that's helpful because no one wants to be constantly sold to all the time. But when mm -hmm. you're talking about similar books, for example, you are kind of telling them this is the kind of writer slash reader I am. And so they're mm -hmm. like, oh, I like your stuff. I like what you're about, even if you're not pushing books on them all the time. 
So speaking of kind of informing your audience of what you're reading and what you're all about, do you use Goodreads for that? Yes, I love Goodreads. Um, I'm actually, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm sure it's not top secret. So I am now a Goodreads tastemaker. So I get to write lists every so often for them of my fave books. Um, uh -huh. and I'm working right now on my favorites of the year and I just love reviewing books. I love talking about books, you know, especially uh -huh. when you know that the people reading it are also super enthusiastic and they're going to be like, oh, that sounds amazing. It's like talking to your friends about whatever you're excited about. So, yeah, I do like Goodreads. <laughs> I think that there are some authors that are a little leery about reviewing other authors' books. Um, talk about your experience with that. Does that worry you at all? Yes. <laughs> My current thing is that I only review a book if I really loved it. Um, when I was starting out, I did used to write, you know, just negative reviews if I hated a book. Um, uh -huh. But I had this issue where I didn't really think of myself for a long time as an author. I was like, oh, you know, I write books, but I don't matter in any way. So I would talk about another author's book. And then I noticed that readers would kind of put more authority in my opinion and be like, oh, well, I'm never going to read that author then. And I'd be like, wait, no, I'm not trying to. This was just my opinion. Please don't. No. So because of that, I only talk about the really positive books. I don't say that I liked something if I didn't, I just, you know, ignore it forever. <laughs> I think that's a that's an interesting and a probably a good way to handle this situation. That way you're still engaged and you're still um, offering positive feedback, but to your point, you're not unduly waiting or influencing other people. Mm. Um so this is an interesting question. So Dave is asking, so finding new email subscribers via organic method uh, seems like a catch-22. You can't get subscribers without those initial readers. So, and you can't get readers without the email list of super fans. So how do you build that organic uh, social or organic newsletter? Um, so I started my newsletter around the time I released my first book. And in the back of the book, I did have a link saying, you know, if you enjoyed this, sign up to my newsletter. But surprise, surprise, no one did. Um, but I bullied all my friends into signing up because I had read somewhere that if you have people opening your emails, it improves your deliverability. So, mm -hmm. for example, I have three email addresses. I signed up with all of them, plus my boyfriend's. And I opened them on all devices. <laughs> and I would text my friends like, did you open the email? Um, and then my third book, it got a big number of readers without my having any kind of email list. I had like 20 people on the list and I knew every last one of them. So you mm -hmm. can get readers without having the email list. It's just, as the question pointed out, a lot harder. Um, mm -hmm. The key there was taking advantage of discoverability on Amazon. You know, when you've got a really tightly packaged book that readers are scrolling and they see it and they know what it is in that split second and they stop and think, yes, you, and then they click. That's the most important thing when you don't have a list. Um, and then also, obviously, the next best thing after an email list is social media because people who are subscribed to you kind of want to know about your books, kind of mm -hmm. want to see cat pictures, but kind of want to know about your books. So if you have a good balance on your social media of fun content and book content, and all of the content ties into like who you are as an author, then that's another good way of getting people interested. Um, so for example, like on my Twitter, I would constantly be tweeting about what I was reading and why I loved it so much or what I was watching and why I loved that so much. And so people knew what kind of media consumer I was. So then when I said, mm -hmm. hey, I've got a book and it's like this meets this, they'd be like, oh yeah, she's the kissing girl. I'll click that. <laughs> so I think that um, one of the things that you just mentioned, that having that tightly packaged book is really, really important. Being able to, in that split second, communicate exactly what the book's about. What are the top things that you do to make sure that that's communicated effectively? So the first thing I do is when I get a book idea, I try to kind of write 
a very bad blurb for it. I'm really bad at blurbs, but something that gets all the hooks in there, the tropes, the main kind of character archetypes. Um, I also like to do a list, like if you read fan fiction, you have like the list of tags at the top, which are basically just tropes and dynamics that people hunt for. And I write that mm -hmm. like it was on a fan fiction page and that helps me narrow down, what is this story I've got? So then once I've figured that out, I can kind of look for other examples. Um, so if I know this isn't what I write, but if I know that I'm writing like a dark billionaire romance with like murder and there's a rose theme, then I can search for that and look at the books that are kind of similar vibes and be like, okay, what do these books have in common? What do they look like? What similar things do they do? Because romance readers, I know I can't speak for other genres, but romance readers are so voracious, especially those that read ebooks. They will think, okay, I'm on a this this week, so I'm going to find every book that's about this. I'm going to download them all and I'm going to read them all. So they know what all those books look like. And so if your book looks like that too, in the ways that matter, they're going to be like, oh, there's one of those books. And you're going to be one of the books that they download and binge read. Okay. So it's kind um, of things so we, like, sorry, go ahead. It's just kind of things like title, background color, you know, like title font, background color. Is it a couple image? And if it is, are they smiling or are they looking intense? How many clothes are involved? Or is it like a broken glass image or a crown or things like that? Things that your lizard brain is going to instantly recognize. Very good call outs. I think that that's something that people struggle with at first. But to your point, doing the research and then um, taking time to figure out how other people and sometimes failing, you know, and then being willing to change it. Hmm. Um, we have a question uh, about how to market it in different countries. So there's a lot of different English speaking countries. How do you make sure that you're marketing in England, Ireland, the US? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, that's something that I've specifically wanted to work on because obviously I'm from the UK and a lot of the books, most of the books that I read were from the US. And so I found when I was putting my books out there, even though they're all set in the UK and they use British spelling, my audience is mostly American. Um, which was nice and I think how I accidentally tapped into that audience is by being a part of that reader sphere because those were the authors that I was reading, the bloggers that I was following, you know, so that's how that kind of happened organically. But then I found mm -hmm. myself having to figure out how to appeal to British people because people in my own country weren't buying my books, which I suppose doesn't technically matter, but I got a bit upset. I was like, what? <laughs> So you really have to get to know each individual market and see what they have in common and what's very different. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, like I think I mentioned here in the UK, um, romance covers are almost always illustrated. If they're not mm -hmm. illustrated, then they are Mills and Boone, which is I think you call it something different. Harlequin. Um, yes. And my books don't really fit that category, so mm -hmm. they weren't appealing to the right audience. So I had to kind of think about, I wasn't going to change my covers from country to country because I'm not that fancy, but I had to kind of think about if I'm if I'm posting on social media at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. when British people are going to be awake and Americans are not going to be seeing this, what kind of graphic am I going to use? It's not going to be like mm -hmm. a hot and heavy graphic that I might use for Americans. It's going to be like maybe like a just a color or a background image with text, for example, I found appeals more to Brits. Um, and to figure that sort of thing out, I just had to research and try a lot of different things and observe authors who were more successful here and see where mm -hmm. I could kind of do similar things without messing up my brand too much. Good. So, I mean, I think that that's a really interesting call out is instead of changing the brand and publishing in, in each of the countries, changing your marketing. Um, so we have someone who is a young writer in college. Uh, do you have a any advice for setting a routine? Oh, gosh, routine. Um, I think routine is something that comes quite naturally to me. 
Um, but if mm -hmm. it doesn't come naturally to you, my best advice is planning things in advance, writing them down, and then kind of setting alarms. So if you have, you know, a schedule um, and you know when you're busy, when you need to be in this class or that class, if you write all of that down, you can find the gaps. And then once you decide that a gap belongs to your writer's time, you kind of block that out very firmly, set timers, make sure people know that you're not to be disturbed and you get into that habit. Mm -hmm. So what is your what is your uh, schedule look like now? What What is your writing schedule or your day look like now? Um, so I'm lucky now because I'm writing full time, whereas when I started, I was also at university. Um, so now mm -hmm. I get up, um, which varies every day. <laughs> and then after I have breakfast, I always come and make sure that my first freshest energy is spent on writing. Um, mm -hmm. Because if I leave it later in the day, and this differs for different personality types, but for me, if I leave it later in the day, my brain is fried and I'm much less effective and efficient. So I make mm -hmm. sure writing is the first thing I do. Um, and I, I tend to have a word goal but it's never a super ambitious goal. I always like to overachieve rather than underachieve. It's better for your morale. <laughs> so I like to give myself a smaller goal and then knock it out of the park and be like, yes, I'm amazing. Um, so <laughs> that usually takes me three or four hours. Then I have lunch. Um, and then if I've got any kind of administrative stuff to do, marketing, things like that, that's what I do in the afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. because I find that that takes less of my kind of rigid concentration. If I'm kind of a bit distracted, I can still get my marketing done and like listen to music while I'm doing it. Um, so it's definitely figuring out where your energy is best spent at various times of the day, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, how, so let's talk a little bit about your writing goals. How often, first of all, do you publish and then how many words each day do you have to write in order to reach that goal? Uh, so when I first started writing, I was publishing a book a month and I, I seem to remember I was writing like 5,000 words a day to do that, um, which I found easy at the time because I was at university and so it was a way to avoid the work I was supposed to be doing. So it was really <laughs> fun and exciting. <laughs> Um, then, you know, after about a year of that, I found myself in a much more stable position. So I felt like, okay, I don't have to work that hard anymore. Mm -hmm. So now I aim to do minimum four books a year, you know, a book a quarter. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but, you know, if I can do more than that, I like to do more than that because I have so many ideas and I want to get them all out. Um, and at the minute, I think, well, I'm kind of on a writing break at the minute, but if I were on a deadline, I would probably be writing anywhere from a thousand to three thousand words a day. I kind of vary it depending on how I'm feeling that day, because, you know, some days mm -hmm. you have a lot in you and some days not so much. Gotcha. Um, so this we always ask uh, if you're a pantser or a plotter, you know, do you plot your story out or do you just write? I'm definitely in the middle and it varies depending on the book. You know, I've, I have mm -hmm. had books where I wrote each scene on a note card and I laid them out on my bed and I was like, oh my God, that's the book. And it followed the plan and it was amazing. But I think I've only done that with two books. The rest, it was like, I know I want this scene, this scene and this scene. And I know I want this trope. And that would be the most information I had. And then I kind of pulled it together as I went. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I like to do is plot like the first act and do that, but I don't know what's going to happen in act two until I get there and plot it from that point. That allows for a bit of flexibility without losing focus, I think, for me anyway. Okay. Um, let's see. I think we've got time for just like one more. Um, so I want to make sure that this is something really good. Okay, let's go back to the time. You said you were writing 5,000 words a day and cranking out one a month um, and you were at university at the time. Um, how were you able to stay motivated and be able to do that? 
Um, there was a couple of things. The first was that, you know, I think when you just start writing, you have all these ideas. And now that I've written more, I know that I have certain ideas that I come back to every time, certain themes and character types. But back then I hadn't written any of them. So I was discovering them all for the first time. And I was kind of telling the story to myself as well. Um, and, you know, the excitement of putting a puzzle together and figuring out how to write a book in the best way possible and experimenting with my own process, that was a, a huge motivator. Um, so I think making sure that you're writing things that you're excited about is one way to stay motivated. Um, for example, I know that a lot of people, if they write a series, they want to put it out all at once because that's better marketing wise. It's easier to get the read through. But I am not really the kind of person who can do that because if I stay in one world for too long, I get super bored. Um, right. So <laughs> I always have to write something different in between. And I was worried, you know, that that would hinder my progress. But actually, I found that all my books were better because I was super excited. You know, when I did go back to this or that series, I was ready to be there. Um, so mm -hmm. that was key to motivation. Also, you know, I wanted money, <laughs> I needed a job. <laughs> and because I was in my last year of uni, I had a student loan, I was living with my mum, but I also knew that that was very soon going to end and I was going to be an official grown up who had to work. And I, I do have a disability and I knew from experience that a lot of people didn't want to hire me or they would hire me and be like, we're gonna accommodate you. And then on my third week, they'd be like, we need you to lift this elephant and I'd be like I can't do we talked about this and they'd be like oh I'm afraid you're not fit for this job so mm. it was kind of like now or never I have to be able to do something that works for me so that was a big motivator like can I get this off the ground can I make this work I'm going to give it my all for this year mm -hmm. well thank you for sharing that with us um we do have one more question because we've been using the term trope a lot. Would you mind explaining what a trope is? Yeah, so gosh, this is where I lose all the words I've ever known. Um, so a trope is kind of like a recurring theme, event, dynamic that pops up in media that tends to be quite tied to the genre. So for example, in fantasy, you have the trope of like the chosen one, the quest, the long journey. Um, and in romance, romance readers are very trope driven. So you have tropes like there's only one bed where the couple go to a hotel or something and they're like, oh, no, we have to share a bed or um, fake relationship where they're like, we are going to we're going to fake a relationship. Nothing about this is real. But then accidentally it is real. Um, so <laughs> I really like tropes and I think that they're great at like hitting emotional notes efficiently mm -hmm. but differently because you can play with a familiar theme through them so um yeah a lot of my writing is very heavily built around tropes thank you so much for sharing that and we're actually at time it's gone by so quickly <laughs> it has <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us and sharing all this wonderful information um, i think a lot of what you brought up was super valuable thank you thank you for having me it's been a lot of fun all right. And for everybody who's joined us today, thank you for joining us. Uh, just a reminder, we will be posting to YouTube. If everything technology goes according to plan, we'll be posting to our YouTube channel tonight and then sending out an email tomorrow with the link to the recording of today's session and also um, a link to all of our upcoming sessions. But um, as always, happy publishing.